Well, welcome everybody to the third installment of OFE's Open Source Policy Series. My name is Ivan Petsch and I am OFE's Research Director and I'll be taking you through our event today. I hope everybody can hear me well. For those who don't know us, Open Forum Europe is a Brussels-based think tank working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. So why did we decide to put together an event on open source and automotive? I think the general issue that prompted us needs really little introduction here. The EU is behind on digitization of its industry. And we all know the headlines. And if you work in Brussels, you will have seen those headlines on the cover of The Economist. We also all know the number of European companies leading digi in digital is pretty small. Usually there's SAP, and then we're pretty fast done with the list. Um, that is what, where policy comes in. And the European Commission notes in their strategy documents, Europe is a continent of industry. And there's few things that are more European industry than the car industry. So we felt this was a good case study to look at how open source software is touching industry. And as someone who never owned a car, but lives in a city obsessed with cars, it's clear that cars aren't going anywhere and that the automotive industry is pivotal to European success. Today, if you think about software, uh, what is becoming important to people when they, today, if you think software is really important when you buy a car. Um, so there's suddenly lots of questions here. And let me be the first one uh, today to say software is eating the world. Uh, will my car drive automatically on the highway? Will it create the perfect route taking into account charging stops? And can I plug in my phone and use that on screen? And I haven't even mentioned all the digitization that needs to happen outside the buyer's view when, for example, building a car. And so today we want to talk about what we see as one of the pieces in the puzzle to succeed in this transition. Um, the aim of this event is to work out how open source is helping the automotive sector to digitize their business from their products to production processes and what the sector needs to accelerate the pace of digitalization. But first, a few words from the sponsor of the OFE Open Source Policy Series, the Eclipse Foundation. And we are thankful for their support enabling us to put this series of events on. After that, we're going to kick off today's event with a keynote speech by MEP Marcel Collaja, Vice President of the European Parliament. Before we segue into our panel of true experts from the software industry, the automotive industry, and the in-between. We'll have a discussion between Deb Bryant, Senior Director at Red Hat's Open Source Program Office, Dr. Katharina Maracke, Associate Professor at the Graduate School for Media and Governance at KU University and Strategic Advisor at Ambition, which is Mercedes uh, Software Development Subsidiary, and Michael Plagge, who is Ecosystems Development Director at Eclipse. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. We want the policy series to be a space for open exchange, and we're very happy to take questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please write your question in the chat or use the Ask Question feature here in Crowdcast. Crowdcast. Please also take a note that this event, like all OFE activities, is covered by the OFE Community Participation Guidelines, which you can read on our website. And I saw that a colleague put a link into the chat uh, and a reminder that this event is being recorded. And so now without further ado, Gael will come on, I think, in a second to uh, speak about what the Eclipse Foundation is doing. There we are. So I will go off and you have the word. Thanks, Stephen. So, well, I'm Gael Blondel. I'm VP Ecosystem Development at the Eclipse Foundation. And yeah, just uh, just a few words before before we start today. So, as you may know, the Eclipse Foundation has decided to move to Europe, and we finalized this move in early January. So. Maybe when you hear about Eclipse, you associate it with uh, the development tools, but uh, that's very important to understand that uh, Eclipse Foundation is one of the large umbrella open source foundations with more than 400 projects. And we cover all kinds of topics. And by the way, automotive is one of our four pillars with uh, IoT development tools and cloud native Java. And with our move to, to Europe, we also invest a lot in AI and cloud, for, for example. So we are very delighted to be a sponsor of the OFE Open Source Policy Series. We, we met with the OFE team some time ago, and we really think that uh, our activities uh, complement each other very well. Also, we think that open source is uh, very important for the automotive industry, and I mean, 
that it's not only important for the design development tools or simulation tools, but also now for the, the platform for the future of automotive. And so our commitment is really to help uh, automotive players thrive in open source. And finally, before uh, to, to keep it short and before giving the floor back to Sivan, I want to, to mention Catena X, which is uh, the B2B platform for the automotive uh, delivery supply chain. And more specifically, Tractor 6. And Tractor 6 is the first open source project from Catena X. And this project started very recently at the Eclipse Foundation. So I, I can tell you that we are very proud and very excited about uh, hosting this project. And well, thanks for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the keynote and the panel today. So I won't be any longer and have a good event. Thanks. Thank you, Gal. So um, now we're ready and I'm glad that we'll be joined in a second by MEP Marcel Collaja uh, providing today's keynote. Um, and I think he'll come on also in a second to uh, take it away. Ten seconds. <laughs> I can see in the tool he's coming on. And there we are. Here we go. Great. Thank you. Uh, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for organizing this event. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to deliver a keynote at the beginning of the event. Uh, I will uh, want to give you a bit um, of um, a perspective from uh, the policymaker, um, from a policymaker who uh, has been interested in free and open source uh, software and open technologies for, I would say, more than two decades now. Um, and I, let me start with um, saying that free and open source software enables innovation and transparency. It strengthens cooperation and fosters a culture of exchange. And this can and, and should be used to the advantage of the automotive industry. I recognize that the infotainment in my car has an ample of bugs. I want uh, to improve the behavior of uh, the adaptive cruise control in my car which also is a technology where users face bugs uh, because every software uh, contains bugs. Um, I remember that one of my late colleagues said once that his car sometimes slams on brakes on a highway while driving on uh, the adaptive cruise control, uh, which apparently is a really dangerous bug. And um, uh, if uh, the software in the car is not open source, then uh, users hardly can do anything about that. But uh, enough of anecdotes. Um, if you think about smart mobility, you could hardly come to a different conclusion than that software has become a crucial element of innovation, uh, driving competitiveness on the market. And in order for this to work, we need a legislative framework that supports collaboration, transparency and exchange of information. Unfortunately, the European Commission failed to realize the importance of open uh, technologies in its various strategies. The EU's industrial strategy recognizes that digital technologies are changing the phase of industry and the way we do business. Uh, then with its strategy on shaping Europe's digital future, the Commission set out its vision for how Europe can retain its technological and digital sovereignty and become a global leader. And this vision incorporates ambitious principles with which all of us uh, can agree, I think. And let me co quote from, uh, from that. Um, the Commission wants a European society powered by digital solutions that are strongly rooted in our common values and that enrich the lives of all of us. 
People must have the opportunity to develop personally, to choose freely and safely, to engage in society regardless of their age, gender, or professional background. Businesses need a framework that allows them to start up, scale up, pool and use data to innovate and compete or cooperate on fair terms." End of quote. Now, however, um, when it comes to uh, concrete initiatives to make this happen, the strategy doesn't mention any action about free and open source technologies. Uh, then the IPR action plan uh, deriving from the industrial strategy goes the same direction. It talks about smart uh, IP policies that can help companies to grow. However, it completely fails to recognize the difference in industries. It aims to encourage and assist companies with uh, so-called intellectual property um, uh, registration uh, to uh, to improve competitiveness and resilience, but introduces no answer to the existing problem of excessive um, uh, patent litigations and the issue of patent trolls, which is a huge problem for many innovators. Uh, these commission strategies uh, came at a time uh, where uh, when there are ample of lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Shortly after the global pandemic hit the world, uh, researchers turned to free and open source research tools and open data platforms. Uh, the combined efforts of scientific researchers and free software developers have accelerated research on coronavirus uh, to unprecedented speed. Uh, medical professionals were working together to share in information uh, on how to repair vital equipment, while others build open hardware alternatives. Uh, the pirates have been calling for policies supporting uh, open collaborative uh, innovation for years. And at this point, uh, probably I should explain uh, why I'm talking about the pirates. I'm a member of the Czech Pirate Party. Um, if that message didn't come through uh, in, in the introduction, um, and uh, if Europe wants to be a technology leader, uh, we need to support SMEs and the development of new technologies. Uh, we absolutely need to reform the patent system. And supporting initiatives on open technologies, uh, both hardware and software, are uh, totally necessary. And last but not least, um, the public money, public code principle needs to be adhered to. Public money has to result in public code. And today, um, I am happy to announce that the European Parliament decided to step up efforts regarding open innovation. Um, in reply to the SME strategy, uh, members of the European Parliament in the Internal Market Committee stressed the importance of open data uh, and um, uh, knowledge sharing via open technologies. In the Shaping Europe's Digital Strategy, the same committee pointed out that economic actors can benefit from free and open source software, and this could even contribute to achieving European strategic autonomy in digital. Um, and we went even further. Uh, the regulation on the biggest fund under uh, the recovery plan, which will distribute about 670 billion for the green and digital transitions, expli explicitly mentions that investment in digital technologies should promote the use of open source solutions. So uh, let me conclude that there is a political momentum to make change happen in Europe. And with that, I would like to thank you um, again for the invitation and I pass the floor back uh, so that you can enjoy uh, the rest of the event. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll be touching on quite a few of those points and I, I fully agree that there really is a momentum right now uh, regarding uh, open innovation, open technologies. Um, 
and digitization uh, of the European society, really. Um, yeah, and I think we'll really uh, touch also, uh, in addition to that, on quite a few points um, that you mentioned there. So um, I'll be joined in a few seconds by our panel. Um, I think so that means that Katharina, Depp and uh, Michael will be come on um, and so that we can kick off the conversation. Uh, I'll just wait one second. I can see our first panelist is here. Michael is here. Depp is here. And I assume that Katharina will also show up uh, in a second. <coughs> I want. I actually did want to start with Katarina, but you know what? We can we can uh, we can turn it around. How about uh, I start um, with Deb? Um, it would be great to get from you to just start things off. A uh, ninety-second answer, um, just kind of understanding a bit from the perspective of a software company, because we'll hear in a second more about the, the car perspective, the automotive perspective. Um, what is open source bringing to the automotive sector in terms of? Um, in terms of uh, uh, sectors and um, um, yeah, what is what is open what is open source bringing to the sure. internet sector? Uh, happy to. So, uh, open source as a collaborative software development model has transformed a number of industries in recent years. Uh, we've seen this, for example, in telecommunications, where software is now literally redefining networks. These are companies that were not known as software companies before that have become so. Uh, these, this also involves companies who would otherwise be considered competitors that are working together for mutual benefit. So I think this kind of transformation opportunity has arrived for the automotive industry as they consider digital transformation. Development models in open source can uh, include transparency, open licensing, the kind of open culture of collaboration that we've seen in other sectors. And these things are huge force multipliers with regard to open innovation, which is a, a key goal for the initiatives we're talking about. Uh, open source development provides a foundation for developing shared technologies, and then the participants can build up upon that and improve to their, their own, own ends. Uh, I guess my final comment would be that open source and more currently open source hybrid uh, cloud uh, technology today and edge ecosystems provide a huge opportunity for automotive to innovate faster, more safely, and with greater regard for end customers. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now to, to kind of hone in on the, the automotive perspective uh, specifically. Um, Katharina, well, for me, Mercedes, they build cars and, and as last I checked, that, that, is, that is hardware. So why did Mercedes create Ambition, um, an organization dedicated to software development? Um, and would you say that Mercedes now is a software company? Well, thanks for bringing up this question. Um, yes, you're right. So Mercedes builds hardware, so we build cars. And um, I think it's important to notice um, what App has already pointed out. Um, open source has, you know, transformed a lot of other industries, and it's about to transform also the automotive or the car industry. So yes, Mercedes will always deliver hardware, but we are in the transformation, right, to become a software company. And this thing, this is where ambition comes into the game. Here. So ambition really is Daimler's in-house startup company, and it was set up with two main goals in mind. So the first one is, of course, to develop software in-house that was previously bought or you know purchased somewhere. And then there's another very important aspect, maybe that's even more important, that's the cultural aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So we need a cultural shift within the company, a shift of the mindset, a shift of the way of working, a shift in the structures and the priorities and so on and so forth. So in a sense, ambition is the you know the in-house troublemaker to build from the bottom up, build the right mindset to become a software company. As I'm trying to find the mute button. Great, uh, thank you, Katarina. Um, and now something that I called now before, sort of the in-between, uh, between software and automotive, going to Michael. I mean, Gail told us just now about Eclipse's move to Europe and also emphasized a kind of Eclipse's um, commitment in automotive. But I was wondering, since I know that you've been spend, uh, spending a lot of time in different uh, companies in the automotive sector and the automotive industry, um, in different roles also, um, if you could kind of give us an in 
intro to how an auto automotive company is impacted by the increasing use of open source, but also in some sense, open innovation and collaboration. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Steven. Yeah, um, so I started to work on automotive software 20 years ago. It was not related to open source software. It was very much closed software development. Um, but what I would like to point out, if we talk about automotive industry, it's not the automotive industry. It's not the automotive company dealing with open source software. Right? So I usually try to separate this in three different layers, I would call. On the first layer, what I see is in-car software plus connected backend software, software which is experienceable by the end user, by the customer of the uh, car manufacturer. You just heard from the anecdote, something failed, the, EVR, the in-vehicle infotainment system doesn't work well. But we also talk about software which is end customer relevant. I think, let's say, software and braking system, software and steering system, which is not directly visible to the end customer, but um, yeah, gives safety to the end customer, that things work, that cars are more reliable, that the value of cars is much higher than it was in the past. The trick stuff here is that this kind of feature, this kind of software is directly impacting, let's say, the top line, the revenue of an automotive company, right? So it's the features which can be experienced by the customer. So customer buys a car because he sees perhaps a certain feature in the driver assistance area or a feature in, in, the, uh, in the infotainment domain. And open source in this area is um, seen for ecosystem development. So we see that the companies see, the automotive companies see huge pressure from new entrants, which comes from the platform software domain. Um, you can, I think I don't have to name them, you know who they are. Um, open source is still used for cost saving. I think that's a quite important aspect, even with open source. Open source is something which is nice, but there's a huge cost pressure in automotive. So having open source for cost saving is for sure a valid aspect of open source. Open source for interoperability that mainly comes with standards. So it doesn't make sense. You cannot compete on standards. So why not putting things together on interoperability standards? And finally, all the software for mastering of complexity, right? So things getting more and more complex where we see 90 different issues in the past. Things are now combined in one big high performance computer in the car. So complexity is rising and inventing everything from scratch over and over doesn't make sense. So having an open source approach, we share these kind of costs with different um, participants in the ecosystem makes sense. The second area I'm referring to is, let's say, OT or shop floor uh, with, uh, with, um, in comparison to IT, right? That means all the things we saw, a couple of announcements by the OEM um, in the past, cooperating with hyperscalers on their production sites, for example, bringing their legacy production sites into the cloud, using data for predictive maintenance, for AI use cases, improving the process efficiencies, stuff like this. And all these kind of things are more, let's say, impacting the, the bottom line, the cost structure of um, automotive companies, right? And here the competition is not so much the new uh, companies from the, from the um, platform software industry, but these are more competition among the automotive companies. And the third area I see usually is the, let's say, general IT area. Although there's a lot of stuff which can be done in open source, starting from web servers for the marketing and sales teams. Um, but this is more like it's not automotive specific. That's a kind of, 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 of software or kind of area which impacts all companies of a similar size and how they could leverage um, the, 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 um, the, the, the benefits from open source but I would not focus here on, on that's not automotive specific. Uh, there again with the mi microphone button, perfect. Uh, I think we'll touch on a lot of those aspects um, and I think maybe kind of um, moving from this, I was wondering if Katharina, you could maybe talk a little bit about kind of the specific business needs, um, you know, now that we have this kind of intro on the, the different layers on the specific dif business needs um, that uh, has really driven this uh, shift to open collaboration in the automotive industry, I think the skills, um, innovation, IP, and these kind of aspects. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, I, I think you already touched upon most of them, right? So the first, <laughs> the most important aspect is the time to market, right? So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, use whatever has already been proven to be right in your product uh, to the extent that's possible. Um, the second one is to attract talent. I think if you're serious about becoming a software company and, and you really need the talent um, uh, for development, then there's no way around open source, right? So that's kind of required. Uh, almost everyone wants to uh, work in an open source company, wants to be able to contribute to be part of the community as part of their, you know, paid job. And um, so that's a that's a no go if you don't offer that opportunity. And then I think uh, on, on top of that, there's probably also um, the, the big picture perspective. Um, that open source enables you as the company to be part of the, you know, new perspective, to bring new perspective into your own, you know, uh, smallish, uh, you know, way of looking at things, if I may put it like this. So when you work uh, in time pressure and, you know, in the automotive industry, you work with deadlines, the, the car lines and so on and so forth, you tend to be tied into the operational duties. and. Um, by working in open source, you force yourself, you force your team to expose yourself to new ideas, to innovation that's happening around your product um, that you may otherwise oversee. So I think there are many different aspects that really uh, puts a, a business need on uh, companies in the automotive sector to really get into open source. Yeah. Um... Uh, very interesting. I, I'm just wondering now a little bit if we go to to Deb because I know that you um, lead the open source program office at Red Hat, and of course, at the end of the day, an open source program office is a lot. Uh, on the one hand, maybe about the IP, but I would imagine at Red Hat a lot about organizing collaboration, about uh, collaborating with with other companies. I'm just wondering um, if you have any thoughts on how this um, maybe would be applied in the automotive sector. And I'm also wondering, maybe this is a follow-up question to Katharina, does, uh, does Mercedes and Ambition, do you have an open source program office? Deb, do you want to go first or was that directly to me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Well, I'm sorry. I thought you were following up with you first. <laughs> you go first. Uh, so, 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 do you have an open source program office at General and Mercedes? I'll let you answer that question. Uh, no worries. Sure. Um, so, we are in the process of setting that up, right? So, we are in the process of, or we, I mean, Mercedes, uh, Mercedes Benz, or the Daimler family is in the process of setting that up. So, you can see it as, of course, we are already using open source components. So, there's the whole question about compliance, how to deal with mm. that, responsibilities, and so on and so forth and and trying to move to becoming really a player in the open source community so along that way we are somewhere in the middle and um, mm. that also includes of you know, setting up an open source program office whether we call it an open source program office whether it's tailored exactly around the common understanding of what we may define as an open source program office um, that's i think still in discussion so there are many ways of tackling the responsibilities and setting up the right processes and all each of these processes i think are you know, uniquely or need to be uniquely tailored to the already existing development processes. So it doesn't really make sense to set up something in theory that you have, you know, learned in some of these forums and discussions and conferences if it doesn't really match with, you know, your already existing development cycle and, and the processes the, that, that Mercedes has already set up. So, um, yes, we are going there, whether it's an, an open source program office or not, that's uh, debated. <laughs> So, yeah, so thank you for that. So I, I would agree that the, the form of something should always follow its function. And you'll find that open source program offices that are formally created often vary in their functionality and scope. We know that Red Hat ours is considerably different uh, because engineering happens elsewhere. So to address your question about what our experience would be to offer where we might uh, encourage collaboration or CEC collaboration in the automotive industry, we, we've certainly had a lot of experience in, in gathering community. It is a huge undertaking, but the results are so beneficial. Uh, it's worth the time in figuring out how to get there. I think with automotive, the best way to inspire that uh, community, and like Michael, I, I probably refer to as the ecosystem rather than the industry, 
is is to address the concerns of the stakeholders directly. Uh, you know, in our case, we would focus on delivering Linux into traditional embedded use cases. Those requirements are evolving, so you need to have an active conversation with with uh, with companies that will be interested in participating uh, and engaging. It means you have to have a, a consistent platform, a way to develop and deploy together. Uh, all in the context of security and functional safety uh, in particular, because it's one of the unique features for the yeah. automotive industry. Uh, it isn't so much about building a single code platform as creating an environment where we may have uh, uh, multiple platforms that coexist and collaborate, but most important is to understand what the goals are and have people who participate, companies who participate, come uh, transparently to the table with their own motivations, and, and that's how you create a uh, start to create a successful project. And Michael, uh, here maybe it's a good opportunity for for you to come in, since you know what a what a foundation does is to kind of facilitate collaboration between companies. As OFV and Fraunhofer, we are doing, um, well, we're conducting the study for the European Commission, and one of the things on open source, you can make impact of open source. Of course, we look on, uh, we look at also the automotive sector, and one of the things that we look in there is the um, is the factor of differentiating um, uh, products um, that uh, collaboration is happening on non-differentiating products. So I'm wondering a little bit if you could talk about kind of why this uh, sharing um, of collaborate, uh, sharing of development. Um, in the automotive sector has become more important and where do you kind of see the potential for common goals um, in in the automotive sector and the development in the software area? Uh, maybe before I answer that later part of the question, I would like to focus a little bit on, 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 on things coming into my mind is um, <laughs> if we talk about open source, it's not clear to everyone open source means are different flavors, let me call that one of open source, right? And I think this, what, some of the standards expectation to open source that there's a certain kind of openness and transparency but just uploading something at one of the coding platforms is also open and transparent but usually it's not enough to force the collaboration partnership between different partners mm. so what we see in the automotive industry that there's a certain expectation when it comes to governance structures starting from antitrust but also have a clear understanding how i can work together what are the rules what is the level playing field and that's something which usually a foundation can provide quite well. On top of this is also what is quite important is vendor neutrality. That means it's, you know, we're talking about products which are on the market for 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And if there is a control of an open source component by a single vendor and that single vendor decides not to go ahead by doing similar, um, it's a problem, right? It's, it's, it's not a smartphone. You, you change perhaps every two or perhaps every four to five years. We're talking about products which are in the market 15 years or even more. So that's something you have to consider. Um, and, and I think what is interesting, I think you mentioned that um, open source does not mean that everything is, is leveled. There are no differences. I think people think if you do open source, you cannot differentiate any longer. And I think that's not true. I think there's areas where you can cooperate on, I call it the underworld, or we talked about what I mentioned before, interoperability, but mm -hmm. there's, should be, and that's at least from the Clips Foundation, always a point which we think is very important, there is place for differentiation. So you need to differentiate because you don't want to have the product look like each other, right? So project from company A should be different from product from company B. You need to define your areas where you can cooperate. Let's say uh, vehicle to X communication. Let's talk about um, other other areas in the, in the driver assistant domain. If, if you talk about uh, global optimized route planning, so that not everyone's taking the same route, stuff like this, um, real time traffic information, all these kind of things, that's something where you may not really can differentiate, you can cooperate. At the same time, if you talk about the level of autonomy, what kind of levels for autonomous, autonomous driving you would like to offer, level two, level three, perhaps later years, later four, later five. That's something where you also can differentiate, right? And mm -hmm. the idea is to, from a foundation perspective, and especially in automotive, where a lot of things comes initially from the from the um, from the from the um, from the, um, from, the, from, the, from the from the compliance perspective, right? So when mm -hmm. I started to, open, to engage with open source in in, in automotive, it, the first question was: There's a list, whitelisted software which can be used, and the, all discussion was about compliance. You are not allowed to use open software initially. And now it's opening up, people see the value, the, the positive aspects of open source, 
but still you need for this kind of big corporates with high liabilities, you need a framework how these organizations can cooperate. And foundations can provide this kind of frameworks. And now with, with the move to Europe, I think the Eclipse Foundation can provide this even with a pure European setup. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned now uh, antitrust. You mentioned governance um, and uh, vehicle to vehicle communication or vehicle to infrastructure communication. And then I see there was a question on standards, on open standards and automotive. And I think all of these topics are very much connected. So I wonder maybe we should go a little bit into the standardization question because I know um, this is a very important topic within the automotive sector. Um, standardization. I'm just wondering if anybody wants to jump in on the role of uh, standards also maybe the role of open standards um, and how this interaction with standardization and open source is evolving since standardization, I think, um, traditionally has is a very important um, factor in automotive and now open source is complementing it. Um, anybody want to jump in on, on this question? I'll try to get <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, so, so I'm not the standards expert in my organization, but I will tell you uh, from many years of history in other, other sectors as well, that I cannot overemphasize the importance of open, open standards. There is no open source software without open mm. standards. And interoperability is key. There will always be legacy systems and other software. So open standards creates an opportunity. Open source is going to be a, a, a a critical element of the work that ahead in the industry. I've observed this in the public and public sector where mm. we uh, adopted open standards to make sure that things were interoperable many years ago. And some of our biggest public failings were, were when we did not. And when we had a proprietary standard fail us like the uh, 9-11 tower horrible event where radios couldn't talk to each other because we had We had standards, we just had mm. multiple standards. So mm. uh, uh, I cannot emphasize the importance of open standards in, in any policy work or technology development. And uh, I, I'm sure Michael can speak to this well because Eclipse is deeply involved in, in standards making. Yeah, let, let me, I, what, what I see interesting, I think what you see, if you look at the software development process in the automotive industry, you see more and more an agile, approach to developing software. And agile developing does not necessarily fit, let's say, to standardization. So what I have the feeling right now is that mm. there's more and more code first or code and specification in parallel. So in the past, we had the classical V model, right? I saw, let's say, specification for head units for navigation system, which has 19,000 uh, requirements, different requirements. So There was a team of people working for two or three years just on the requirements document. Then there was an implementation phase. And that's that, that specification is like, it's not a standard, but it has a similar approach as a standardization, right? And, and then there was the implementation phase that was just an integration mm -hmm. phase, just according to the classical demo. What we see right now, more and more companies talk about customer stories. They have HR developments, two-week sprints, four-week sprints. And that does not necessarily fit into the world of standardization. So what I see right now is that more and more companies, perhaps not necessarily an open source, but they start really having that agile approach to the feature development. And this is perhaps not 100% compatible with the old way or the traditional way, not old, the traditional way of, of, of doing standards. And I think it would be interesting to see how this will develop in the future. Because if you all look into software companies, um, they just, Time to market was, was, was one of the things Katarina mentioned, right? Yeah. Time to market and standards is something which may not fit all the time well together. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I mean, it's clear that we're seeing these questions pop up, not only in the automotive sector, it's very clear, the question around uh, time to market for standardization and how that um, how that uh, meshes with open source, I think is becoming really important in a lot of different sectors. Um, I'm thinking we kind of maybe uh, in a very specific topic, and I think maybe we could hone in on some of the really practical kind of technical examples um, where projects are making a difference in terms of reusing of components in terms of kind of the broader open innovation potential i'm wondering katarina if there's any examples that you have from your work at ambition from your work at mercedes um, here where you can talk about how open source is really changing the way um, an automotive company is approaching um, a project a product 
um, compared to maybe five, ten years ago. Yeah, maybe also one follow up comment on the you know discussion on standards. Yeah. Um, because I think it's there's a the general theme that we can see in the automotive industry, which is they are clearly lacking behind, right? Let's face it. So um, in the whole context of becoming open source companies, become software companies, and then becoming open source co software companies, they are not very much advanced. So most of them, all of them, I would say, um, use open source components. And probably all of them have figured out how to use them in a compliant way, more or less, right? Okay. But I think very few companies have really made the step towards what we would call open innovation, you know, innovate together mm. with competitors in, in open platforms. And I think that the same is true for standards. I think the standards still need to be built in that sector, right? So even whether it's open standards or just generally speaking, technical standards, I think Uh, the automotive sector is, is still in the beginning of, of you know, building that and, and setting that up. So um, with regards to, you know, open source projects that really make an impact, I think they, they still need to be developed, right? So we, we are really at an early stage. Um, mm. It's not that you can say like in the, in the embedded world, we see everything is Linux based. And of course there's Linux in, you know, in, in automotive products, but I think the, the real benefit of open innovation, of using open source in the sense of being an open source player, being able to maintain, contribute, uh, you know, facilitate a community, that step nil still needs to be done. So yeah. I, I really see, uh, you know, we would need to give the automotive sector a little more time and maybe help them, you know, push them a little bit into the right direction because this whole idea is completely new, right? So they yeah. were set up to, you know, we do it in-house, we do it differently and we do it better. And, you know, for a long time that was successful, but now, you know, there really needs to be a shift uh, in the mindset, as I said earlier. Yeah. Do you, uh, well, this question I think could go to everybody really. Um, do you see any areas where there's a specific need really um, to go down this route? I'm thinking maybe automotive, autonom autonomous driving, thinking about, Can one company do the do this on their own? Is that maybe too much kind of to ask in terms of capacity, uh, the production, something that I assume to some degree is um, you know similar process across different companies. Any any thoughts maybe on where really the need or the maybe the benefit would be the highest? I mean, I can start and others may have, you know, different perspectives. Um, I see, you know, the need on all different levels, whether we talk about autonomous driving, ADAS, I mean, for sure, it, it would be beneficial for the, you know, advancing the technology if, if the companies would be working together and use um, standardized, you know, platforms would share innovation and then build on top what would ben then be the differentiating part. Um, but the same is true for, you know, infotainment and stuff, right? So you, it, when you go into navigation, you will see that many companies are using uh, open data already, but this is really just a, a very small point uh, tip of the iceberg, right? So there's so much potential on all different levels. And mm. um, I think I'm kind of repeating myself, but my feeling is that, you know, the, the cultural shift, the, the way of seeing things differently um, still has to happen, is, is mm. not there yet completely. So um, in, in each of the automotive companies, you will find um, people who have that mindset already and who really want to change things. But you will also see a lot of, you know, management people who, as you said earlier, who have grown all the way in the hardware um, uh, cycle and, and who have, you know, successfully delivered great cars over the past uh, 40 years. And it's very hard to explain that, you know, innovation in terms of software mm. can work differently in certain areas. So it's, it's a lot of explanation education, I would even say, right, uh, on, on especially, let's put it, frankly, middle management. Okay. Yeah, Michael, I always have another I, I, yeah. I congratulate this to the comment just popping up in, in the chat window. Um, I think we treat the automotive software guys a little bit unfair, right? Because I think the quality expectation for automotive software is different. 
So especially if we talk about, let's say, the traditional software parts like braking, steering system, power shift, uh, powertrain software, that comes quite often with financial safety requirement, ASIL B and ASIL D. And an ASIL D software is a complete different story than an app for a mobile operating system, right? Um, functional safety is a topic. And I think here also, I think there have been or are still concerns on, in preparation of the panel today. I read an article, I think it was on The Economist for two, two years ago, which stated open source and ISO 26262 is not compatible. There will be no open source projects which will achieve an ASLD certification, mm. for example, according to the safety element out of context, which is not true because, and that's why I think by our race set point, we just did, or not we, but uh, it's the company, we just did it for an out from the software stack, um, which is based on open source, and namely on the uh, RS2, which just received that um, um, uh, safety element out of context certification, uh, ACLD level, uh, for an open source for a software component which all the consist of uh, includes open source components, and I think that's a major step because having this functional safety requirements is hard work for auto automotive mm -hmm. software developers. But having now the proof point that this is all the possible in open source, I think that's all the big step for open source for the acceptance of open source in the domain of automotive software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would follow and, and, and echo that. I think the the cultural changes that Katrina has pointed out are really essential because what, we're, what the opportunity and the challenge is going to be is to change the way we're thinking about how we design cars, right? So rather than developing these components in isolation, which historically didn't talk to each other, we're now ultimately going to treat the car like an edge device and put it on the internet. So the long vision is smart cities and interconnectedness. And so you have this seamless ex experience. The challenge is going to be to take advantage of the open source model, not just functionally from the development point of view, to really change the way we're thinking about how we do design together, where the standards come in and how we can shift that thinking. I think it's uh, an incredible opportunity. And I see some comments in the chat that mm -hmm. reflect that some of our audience actually understand that. That, that yes, we, we think about having a higher standard. I believe last year when I was at the European Commission's uh, 2020 roadmap session, someone there, uh, their public testimony was that open source would never uh, meet uh, safety, safety standards and those requirements. I think we're starting to shift our thinking and I see some of our audience understands that, but, but I, I'm excited about the the, the the notion that we can change together change the way we're thinking about designing cars. I don't think it's impossible that maybe even Jonas, who uh, I see has made a comment now, uh, has said that because I think at the was it, it was 2019, what a beautiful world that was, uh, at the looking at 2020 ahead event the commission had. I'm just wondering, in, I have to say also culture is one of the things that um, in, in the study that we're conducting also very much has stuck out as extremely important um, leveler. I'm just wondering, Deb, to maybe um, uh, bring it back to you as probably the biggest open source company in the world. Do you have uh, any tips uh, for uh, convincing your management of open innovation of open source? Because I assume you have to do this work sometimes with companies that you uh, that you work with, that you collaborate with. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I think that's probably the most advice I've ever been asked over the last 15 <laughs> years or so in any sector I've worked in is how do I convince my manager? And uh, and and there there. Are, different tips you know one is that we have found that uh, leadership uh, is most comfortable uh, gaining confidence from their peers so it's really helpful to find other companies who have already done similar work before and get those people talking to each other uh, it's also helpful to find out where where some of the pitfalls are and so uh, with all respect to my colleague who is an attorney uh, often attorneys and companies are the first first barrier uh, to participating in open source <laughs> communities. And we have we have secret weapons at Red Hat. Their names are Richard Fontana and Scott Peterson. And we're, we're uh, grateful that they will go out and talk to attorneys directly about some of their concerns, because those things are manageable. But the advice is, you know, find, find people in other companies that are doing similar work. You know, so you have use cases 
you know, ask people for help. Red Hat has a library of use cases that may be from an industry that can be helpful. And, uh, and, and look for organizations, uh, large organizations like Eclipse Foundation that have the, that kind of experience where they can introduce you to others that have uh, tried to uh, uh, hoe that road before. Perfect. Um, maybe let's stay on the theme of challenges. Um, and this one, I think, goes to maybe Michael, but as always, uh, everybody who wants to jump in. I'm just wondering maybe then about the challenges. Um, and I know you've worked on the kind of the supplier level before, so I think you're probably very well placed to answer this. What are kind of the challenges from the OEM perspective, from the supplier perspective, um, for enabling a cooperating system? And maybe, Katharina, there's something for you to jump in, because I know that... In the past, uh, lots of software or firmware was provided by suppliers of the different tiers, but this might get more centralized today. So I'm wondering maybe if you also have a reflection on, on this development. So two questions. To <laughs> if, if you don't mind, I, I, I would start. So I, I see two, two different, um, let's say, areas. One is what I would say the internal challenges, and the other one is the external challenges. So from the internal challenges, if you look in a modern car, which hit the road, let's see, three to five years um, before, I see there have been 80 to 90 small little computers inside, right? And each mm. computer acted uh, in the, more or less in the, for sure they were communicating each other, but it was mainly the task of the automotive company was system integration. The computer mm. and the software in the computers um, based on technologies like OSEG or Autosar, there was developed by the T1, T2 supplier. So the T1 supplier had the software integration capability and the OEM had the system integration capability. What we see right now, driven by stuff like like, like um, multimedia systems, um, navigation systems, but all the driver system systems, there's a tendency to replace 90 smallies used by three or four big high performance computers. And suddenly, the system integration capabilities of the OEMs is not any longer, or it's not as long required as much as previously. So suddenly, mm -hmm. the OEM has to have software integration capabilities. Because what happens here is, if something goes wrong, the qu first question is always, who is responsible? Five years, 10 years ago, that was easy. Just look into the direction of the T1 supplier. Um, today, it's difficult, because if the software, if we have 10, 15, 20 functions in one ECU, in one high-performance computing ECU. It's not clear who is responsible if something goes wrong, if timing is incorrect, if something crashes and similar. So that means, and that was also, as you can see from the development of the software capabilities within the car manufacturers, they changed from being, let's say, doing specifications and being project leads into being software developers. I think Ambition is the best example for that one, right? 10 years ago, there was nothing like an Ambition. I would, I would claim that there was hardly anyone within Diamond organization who was able to write software. And this completely changed because these capabilities are needed. And that's coming back to the challenges for the car operating system, being able to that kind of software integration, integrate different functions in one high performance computer in the car. I think that's exactly the, the challenge which has to be solved by, by the OEMs. On top of that, we see things like, like again, functional safety requirements, ISO 26262. We have the long-term support. And I think the key enabler for doing this is what I would call over-the-air updates. I think if you if you look, I, I don't want really want to mention Tesla, but honestly, I think the innovation of Tesla is not the electric car. It's not the electric drive. The innovation by Tesla is the over-the-air updatability. They mm. are able, they, you know, they don't have to care if the software is error free because they can replace it over the night. And that's something that's a capability which German or European OEMs all the well are able to roll out, but they missed it and they have a five years gap, let's say, to other competitors for, for over the air updates. As soon as this is available, I think it's much easier to develop software and also especially car OS software. Coming to the external requirements, it's difficult, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough market. You have Android Auto on the other side. You have companies like QNX, which have a track record on, 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 on operating systems, platforms. And the question here is, it's not only that they have a technical advantage, but if we talk about car OS, if we talk ecosystem, if we talk platform, they all usually have platforms of a certain size in place. If you look at Volkswagen, they're selling, I think, 10 million cars a year. Let's say 5 million cars equipped with a head unit, which can 
provide connectivity services, it's 5 million, right? If you look into services like Facebook or similar, they talk about billions of people into the ecosystem. The question here, if you build an environment, a cooperating system just by yourself, how can you scale in a way that you are also attractive for third party software suppliers, app service providers, or similar? And that's something which I would call the external challenge. You have to compete mm -hmm. with well established companies, which only not only have the software capabilities, but all the sometimes already platform of a certain size in place. Yeah, many, many topics <laughs> that I could potentially address. Maybe a start with the first one. You mentioned Tesla. Of course, Tesla is uh, five years ahead of all of the European car makers. That's absolutely right. It's not only in terms of electricity, it's also connectivity, right? So what they are doing with the Starlink now, you know, um, there's, a, there's a real gap. On the other hand, they don't have the legacy, right? And numbers prove that, you know, connectivity and electricity is not the only thing that the customer cares for. So it's a very complex topic, um, I think, the discussion about Tesla, um, as much as I would love to continue on this. Um, I wanted to make one final comment on the on the safety, functional safety and security requirements, mm -hmm. because I think this is, you know, quite often it's being put as an obstacle. And I see Jonas already posted in the chat. Hi, Jonas. I think he can probably speak much better on this than I can do. But, you know, I've seen this in, in different industries that, you know, there's always this argument of, you know, we can't do this because we have special requirements. Talk to the banking industry, talk to the credit card payment systems, talk to the healthcare sector. They are all they all have to deal with very special requirements, ISO standards, you know. Uh, now in the automotive sector, we have this new UN regulation uh, on security, which is not even talking about functional safety, it's just security, how you make sure that, you know, everything's, uh, uh, you know, protected from, from outside attacks and so on and so forth. So there, there are always arguments, but as Jonas has already put, we can deal with that, right? So there are projects, I mean, maybe the LISA project should be mentioned here, which deals with Linux in the context of functional safety. There are probably new projects coming to the uh, uh, Eclipse Europe, because this is a great host for these kind of uh, uh, topics that, you know, many players can openly discuss and find a solution. So I wouldn't really let that count as an argument. Um, we, we need to deal with that and we need to find a way to make uh, open source uh, software uh, being compliant somehow, if I may use this term, um, with these requirements. All right. Um... Maybe I just I just realized maybe Michael you can just say what the distinction between a tier one and a tier two supplier oh, is. Sorry, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if that's so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, uh, if you worked for twenty years, so when I call OEM, and that's interesting that the opposite meaning in, from other industry, the OEM is a car manufacturer, right? Like mm. the, like a Daimler, that's an OEM, right? Then the tier ones are usually companies like Conti, Bosch, Denso, who provides let's say complete system for the car, and then you have a tier two or tier three supplier which provide part of the system could be hardware parts but could be mm. also software parts right that's let's say just in my previous company I called for a company called electrobit electrobit delivered navigation software to another company that company integrated the navigation software into the head unit and then delivered the final head unit for to a company like like bw for example so it's a tiered approach in the past and that's also interesting if we talk about and it's a strong hierarchy so automotive complete automotive industry is driven by strong hierarchies, right? So the business mm -hmm. relation, if you look at how many end customers from an industry perspective you have, so how many car manufacturers are still there out there? 15, perhaps 20. So everything at the end of the day, all the projects, all the work ends up in 15 or 20 companies. Now with open source, suddenly this hierarchical tiered industry and the way how these things work together suddenly is, a tier three is perhaps at the same level as the OEM. And this is something which all that has to be learned by the OEMs. The OEM are used to control. And in an open source environment, usually at least an eclipse foundation from a meritocracy. So everyone has the same voting rates. In, in, in the, from an OEM perspective, perhaps worst case scenario, right? <laughs> having this kind of, of, of I, level playing field for all participants of the system is something that the, the complete industry is not used to. I'm not saying that's that they cannot get used to it. But at the moment, all the structures, let's say from the purchasing department and similar, is 
complete still focused on this on this pyramid of mm. the hierarchy it is almost something philosophical um, in a sense because um, you were speaking before about integration you know between the suppliers and the oem integrates all of these um, disparate pieces and in uh, of open source of course a big part is integrating lots of different open source components um, and here I'm wondering a little bit, and this is the lawyer's perspective, and we talked about functional safety now a bit, and I'm wondering, this goes to Katharina, because I know that you're a lawyer. Um, when integrating open source components, what is the liability, uh, what is sort of the liability situation when Mercedes has their first uh, auto, um, automated car out and, you know, the, the, the negative scenario, let's say, happens and it crashes? who then is liable, the original su supplier of the open source software, or maybe even some community person, some poor community person who's <laughs> who's um, who's um, supporting uh, a piece in there, in, in the, the, let's say, web of software that's being used. So I'm just wondering if you could, um, yeah, uh, expand a bit on that. Yeah, I think it, it goes also back to what um, I just said. I think in the past, or maybe that's still the current framework in the automotive industry, being used to this hierarchy of different tier suppliers, the automotive industry really likes to push the liability by contracts to the, the tier one, tier two, whatever. Mm -hmm. right? so in the contract, you clearly have that that section that, you know, who's responsible, who's liable for what. And that whole setting is currently changing. And frankly speaking, that is a real challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially, I mean, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but when we look at open source components and the, the, the common open source licenses that we all know by the open source definition, um, most of them have a disclaimer in there, right? Uh, you, you get rid of all the, the liability. That mm -hmm. unfortunately in the German context is not valid. And I'm pretty sure in, in most other jurisdictions, we have a similar legal system. So you can't really get rid of the full liability. You will always be liable for what we would call gross negligence, right? So you cannot say I'm, I'm completely out of the game. I, I waive everything. And this makes it tricky. And I see certain concerns, especially when it comes to allowing people um, in the company to contribute to open source projects. There's always the question, so if you, you know, work upstream and, and someone else implements that system, that project, whatever, in the car, um, and then the car crashes, as you have just seen, who is responsible? Will, will we, as a contributing company, be eventually be responsible or liable for that? And uh, on top of that, we also have the, the product liability law in the European context, which is, you know, translated into the, the German context uh, for the Produkthaftungsgesetz, which is a nasty beat that explicitly says that, you know, the, the supplier is liable. And eventually, if you break down, then that would go to the original software developer. probably. Mm. But this is all, I think, in the process. And I would be a little bit provocative here because, you know, this is also a policy event. I think we need uh, clarity. I think we need a yeah. clear framework on who is liable for what in the end. And that should be, you know, that kind of framework should be done with all the players around the table. So it should not be done by, you know, people who have a legal expertise but don't know how automotive works. And um, I mm. think the automotive industry has to be invited and has to be around the table to see what's feasible. But there's definitely a need for, you know, policymakers to help uh, provide clarity on, on how this can be handled. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm thinking about, because you now speak about um, um, kind of the, the collaboration between the, the suppliers and uh, the industry. And I'm wondering maybe, Deb, if you could talk a little bit about what is necessary to achieve a good community, um, a sustainable community in some sense, maybe around a project, um, you know, one would assume that this often includes the OEM, let's say in the, let's, let's say, I guess in the automotive sector, the OEM and then the different suppliers. Um, what is necessary to be put in place to have a good community, good collaboration to uh, achieve kind of the common goals? Yeah. Well, so I want to answer that in two parts. One is that, the we're, we're relatively new in creating these kind of communities inside the automotive ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And 
Michael's highlighted and uh, so Katrina highlighted some of the challenges in terms of the way OEMs have thought about how they they relate to the software in a car or how they're in the supply chain. So that's going to be a very interesting conversation in the ecosystem that's but will ultimately be centered around projects that are launched and how mm. how how those organizations and commercial concerns enter the ecosystem. What makes it successful or what, what, what makes it successful? One is really starting with a very clear understanding of the problems you hope to solve together. You know, if you, uh, I mean, this goes for most things in business. If you, you don't have a really clear definition that everyone looks at and understands what you're trying to solve to, you're not off to a very good start. So, uh, uh, a, a very important feature of a community is agreement on the problems they want to solve together and also an acknowledgement because that community is going to include both technical and business people and understanding where you probably most likely differentiate on the product side, on your on your secret sauce, on your special sparkle you're, you're putting in the project. So I'd say it starts with clear understanding. It it's, uh, also should include really broad calls for all stakeholders. Uh, you'll have large companies, you'll have SMEs that will participate in this kind of ecosystem. Mm. So people feeling that they uh, have an opportunity to be included uh, in the front end is really important. They're mm. more likely to be engaging or decide not to engage but not throw stones at your idea along the way if they've been consulted early on. And uh, there's a couple of ideas for, for, uh, for early strong starts. In terms of the sustainability of the community, a, a well-defined governance model that's a right fit for the project is important. You know, not all projects need to be in a foundation. Some really do. Well, the, the more complex, the, the more uh, industry participation, sometimes you need, you need to have that very formal project structure. And mm -hmm. then just along the way, all the best practices that you see in, in open source go for healthy uh, and sustained communities, good communication, transparency, uh, and... Uh, and all the all the other uh, technical uh, best practices that go along. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to go because you mentioned now SMEs, and I think this is something that's really on the top of mind for European policymakers. Uh, if we look at the numbers, um, uh, don't quote me on this. I think it was eighty to ninety percent of European companies are SMEs. So this is extremely important. And I'm wondering, Michael, um, I I would assume. Please correct me if this is wrong, that from the supply, supply perspective, uh, SMEs, uh, German Mittelstand now, maybe we talk about that, uh, is relatively important um, in, in the automotive sector. I guess maybe Katharina is also it's interesting for you. So I'm wondering kind of what is being done to, uh, to include SMEs at Eclipse, maybe specifically, um, and uh, what are the challenges? Because what we often hear, this is from the standardization world actually, is that it's difficult to have SMEs, uh, to include SMEs in standardization activities because they don't have the time for it. But I'm wondering, is that similar to an open source or different? Uh, honestly, I think that's different. Mm -hmm. because my feeling is that in projects open transparent so each one in a vendor neutral way can contribute there is no difference so a daimler don't have more power in one of our projects than a small mid-price enterprise organization mm -hmm. has in the project right and i think the the things which are developed there are directly tangible it's not like a standard mm -hmm. which is just one step to the final product but the software is already a big step into into the final product what i see more as a challenge is you know, we get all these regulations, starting from the GDPR, I'm not saying that this is bad, but we have the reg reg regulations, GDPR, now there's this new AI regulations, mm -hmm. which has been published, uh, I think, last week, something like yeah. that. And for large organizations, it's much easier to deal in a compliant way than for small organizations. And I think that's, that's the biggest issue. If a diamond has an organization, perhaps for 30 people, dealing with this AI regulations, make sure that the company behaves in a compliant way, that's not, not a real cost factor, right? But if you have a, have a small mid-price enterprise with 500 people, you would have to have the same size of team. It would be not, not, not. You cannot finance this kind of things, right? So I think what is different, uh, what is also dangerous for small mid-price enterprises when we talk about policies, is that smaller mid-price enterprises needs to be able to afford to be policy compliant. And I think the bigger the organization, the easier it is. Because if you look at the overall cost structure, the, the, the part for the, the, 
the share for the compliance work is less and less and less, the bigger the organization will become or is. But for small companies, com being compliant with these kind of regulations can be a real challenge. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, something that I, I also have a very strong personal interest in. I, it reminded me a bit uh, when there was a, a text around NVIDIA here. So this goes to chips and hardware. Um, we are seeing, I think, you know, the news uh, has has been around that uh, automotive companies, are, um, car companies are um, um, not producing sort of right now at the speed that they could because there is a shortage in chips. Now, it's clear from that that there is maybe not so much control and relatively much dependence on uh, companies around the world, mostly in, in Taiwan and uh, I think in, in Asia specifically, uh, that produce those chips that are needed to produce cars. Uh, this question was supposed to go to Katarina, so I do hope she returns <laughs> in a second. <laughs> uh, there she is, fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, we're gone for one second. Um, open source software, that provides control for companies over the um, the software that they use uh, because it is, in, you know, everybody can use it and so nobody can take it away from you in some sense. So I'm wondering in terms of chips and hardware, if there are any considerations on the level of Mercedes um, to, to do something in the space. I'm also thinking about, you know, when we think about electrical mobility, we see that uh, lots of companies are now investing in capacity um, for batteries. The apparently taboo Tesla word comes to mind. That I know it's building a big factory in, in Berlin. Um, but I know that some, also some European car companies, I think are uh, organized in North Vault. Um, one of the suites in the chat will surely let me know if that's not correct. Um, so there's investments happening in hardware in this kind of strategically important area. Uh, any considerations regarding chips um, specifically uh, with there being uh, much more kind of um, development now on the open hardware front? Yeah, I, I can kick off the discussion. I see that risk five should be mentioned here. And I'm, I'm very much interested. I mean, it, it still needs to prove if it really kicks off, right? So if it, mm. if it really um, will be successful in the end. But I think this is one approach towards, you know, some level of openness on, on the hardware front, if I may say so. Mm. Whether or not the automotive industry and, you know, considering Daimler as one of the even more traditional ones, I would say, in that uh, industry, will jump on that. Um, it, that's not my turn to comment on or to say. I mm. wish um, they would do because I feel this is something that, you know, everyone should engage in. Um, otherwise, it will not be successful. Um, but, you know, my, my current observation is that there's enough work to do still on the software front, right? <laughs> okay. um, you know, then back to the second question, which I think is, is a little bit separate from that, too. To what extent do we need more investment on the European ground? Absolutely, right? I mean, whether it makes sense to support international companies to build something in Europe, mm. I would question that. So I would rather see, you know, something coming from within Europe and, you know, see mm. you know, innovation happening really among the European players. Mm. But let's face reality. We all know that it's difficult, right? It's difficult to compete against um, the big US and, and of course, also the Chinese players. And um, to me, as always, uh, one way to leverage that is to find ways to collaborate instead of, you know, um, building something equivalent and then trying to compete from scratch, which might be difficult. Mm -hmm. I think we, we need to find a way to collaborate with, with the big guys. Yeah. Um I think, well, in some sense, I guess the, the, the takeaways from open source software also apply to hardware in that sense, the, the need for collaboration. And I guess uh, then the, the commission proposal to invest uh, um, what can be maybe colloquially called a lot of money into a European chip uh, um, uh, facilities. I think I saw something 145 billion euros. Um, um, yeah, clearly, uh, clearly uh, sounds like you're in support of that. <laughs> 
Um, I'm thinking maybe, and you could kick off discussion almost before, if we talk a little bit about the, the, the policy context. Um, and I'm wondering, Michael, if you have any thoughts, because now we're seeing what Katharina has now a few times said is something that is now slowly being created in the automotive sector, uh, uh, open source software collaboration. It's now being, um, it's now happening slowly in the automotive sector. Is there something that um, you see uh, or where uh, Eclipse is involved in kind of speaking to governments, to policymakers, to make sure um, and educate, I guess, on this change that is happening and to make sure that uh, this is being um, taken into account in policymaking? So, Yes, so one, one, one good example is being part of that panel here today, right, to talk about <laughs> policy makers and so on. Um, I think it's, 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 it's not so much about automotive. We talk a lot about, let's say, open source in general, mm -hmm. open source for, for GovTech, for, uh, for public sector, open source, for example. Uh, but I think the, the arguments are not too much different. So I think what we talked about, openness, transparency, and similar, uh, these apply in, in a similar way all to the automotive. So uh, with this regard, if we talk about open source in general, um, that's, that's, that's not, not too much different from, from, from other things we are talking with. with um, it's either we are, we are, we are the, the industry associations, we are, we are members, and just to name it for Germany, we are the Eclipse Foundation, member of the Bitcom, of the Eco, mm -hmm. and so these kind of things. Um, for automotive specifics, I'm not aware, but that may all the change in the future, right? So I, I mentioned that we have this force, uh, functional safety related stuff here. Mm -hmm. We talked about, Katarina mentioned that there may be new yeah. and updated policy in the future. And based on the technical expertise we have, our, our members have, I think it would be all quite interesting to facilitate discussion with the policymakers if they would need technical or input or, or yeah, feedback from experienced people in that area. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to come in on this? Otherwise, uh, I have a question maybe on uh, the upcoming industrial strategy. Um, this was supposed to, I mean, well, the industry, the EU industrial strategy that already came out last year in, uh, in I think, March 2020. What timing? Uh, and now that we have a year of COVID, uh, they decided they need to update this. And I think it really happened also in the... Um, kind of under the impression of dependencies that have been identified through what we see with COVID. I think, you know, there's clear dependencies that we see now today. Um, so that is a thing that the new industrial strategy we hear um, will, and it's coming out tomorrow, um, apparently, will um, uh, focus on a lot. So I'm wondering, is dependencies something that, uh, I think this question goes out to everybody, is dependency something that the EU should focus on with industrial policy or are there other areas that you think make much more sense to focus on? No takers? No, I, I just, so, you know, there's, there's this, this, there was just, uh, I think the paper, but the uh, German IT Rat on, on digital sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they mm -hmm. define three goals, which I like. I think the one is um, having the uh, ability to change. That means having more than one supplier for certain stuff, right? The second one is the, the ability from a policy making perspective to shape and to create something. And the third one is more to influence what I would say is a traditional way by, by, by regulations, by political steering, but especially that point, shape and create. That means being active part of that ecosystem and not only regulating, not only being at the sideline and watching what's happening on the playing field, but being a perhaps more active partner here. Sorry, we talked about this for the, for the hardware now, but in, in general, being more active partner in in supporting stuff like open source, um, uh, which all then enables this kind of, of, of uh, getting rid of dependencies or controlling dependency. I think that's a quite interesting approach, not only coming via regulations, mm -hmm. but all the playing an active part in overcoming dependencies. And I mean, maybe a reflection, reflection from my side with open source, I think I've mentioned this, I think it's being um, seen as, as a way to overcome dependencies. But of course, at the same time, um, it is not a protectionist uh, way of, of um, um, 
attacking, let's say, that problem. Because of course, at the end of the day, with open source, it's still available to everybody. Um, so I think that's uh, well, that's maybe quite interesting. I'm wondering before before we go uh, before we go kind of into the final rounds. Um, I'm wondering, and this goes uh, goes to Katarina now regarding. Um, the, the more the kind of the practicalities, I guess, of building software um, or building software for a car, has uh, has um, uh, Mercedes do, does Mercedes ha have its own operating system like uh, Tesla, um, or is it something where there's a lot of integration happening? So this is something that you are centralizing more. Um, <laughs> I think I'm not in the position to talk, uh, you know, in detail about what the uh, uh, operating system will look like and, and what All it right. will be. Um, I think it brings us back to the point where we where what we talked about in the beginning, right? So Mercedes, or you, you can call the whole Daimler family, is in the transition of, you know, doing more stuff in-house. And while we are transitioning from, you know, hardware and, and purchase using the software to be built into the car, what Michael has, you know, outlined earlier as a fully you know, full prepared system. Of course, the, the, the goal is to ultimately control what I would call crown jewel, right? So there is a mm. certain desire of having something that is proprietary and that is then the unique user experience that differentiates the Mercedes car from the Tesla, from the BMW, from the Volkswagen, whatever. And I think that is a natural, you know, evolving process. And in the middle of that process, of course, there's the question about the operating system. To what extent that will be fully in-house, to what extent there might be open source layers involved. I think this is all in the making, in the baking. And, um, you know, that's probably the, the most interesting part for, for all the automotive uh, uh, players, right? So it's not only Mercedes. You could go and, and ask the same question to BMW, and you would probably get a very similar answer, right? So we are in the <laughs> in the process of you know, designing that and, and finding out what makes the BMW different from the Mercedes, right? Mm. And I think this is only this is only natural because as much as we all want to collaborate, in the end of the day, they are still competitors, and that's good, right? So um, there should be the customer should have the choice in, yeah. the, in what car they want to buy and where they want to invest. Well, I've seen the um, the announcement, I guess, for the the new S class. No, it's not. It's not called the S class anymore. Uh, it's the EQ, EQS. I remember EQS. this, okay. EQS, which I, I've seen is essentially one huge screen inside um, or many screens, screens galore, really. Um, so uh, I, I assume at least uh, to some degree, there have been some work, has been some work uh, on the on the uh, on the Mercedes side, but I understand. Uh, maybe we but, can't you know what? Maybe one final question on that. So to me, what is not really important is the question whether there's one big screen or two screens, <laughs> or you can move them around, and you know whatever. What really counts is in this way of transforming to become a software company the most important cultural aspect that needs to be tackled is the customer centricity so what counts is not if our designers like it this way better or that way better or i like it this way better what really counts is will we be able in the future to listen to our customers and implement that feedback quickly because that's all that counts right so mm -hmm. And, you know, let's go back to Tesla because that's the, the elephant in the room, right? So someone tweets to Elon, I'd like to have that feature. Two days later, it's in, right? So now this is not possible to the screen design, but I think, you know, the, the, that kind of mindset, let the customers decide. And, you know, the customer in China is completely different from the customer mm. in Europe and from the customer in the US. And you know, Mercedes and all the other car makers want eventually to deliver cars all over the world. So you need to be able to really quickly react to what your customer um, yeah, wants as a product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now it might be fancy to have a big screen. Okay, fine. But frankly speaking, as long as it, the car is not fully autonomous driving, is that really helpful at all? I mean, it's interesting. I, I will. This is my only contribution to the uh, elephant in the room Tesla conversation. 
I was on the phone with a colleague in Berlin on Friday. And we, uh, I asked him what he was doing on the weekend. He said, I'm spending the weekend deciding which car to have my company lease me. And he said, I'm down to two choices. He said, I, I, I love Tesla software. They have great software. They have a terrible car. I love Daimler's cars. They have wonderful cars. They have terrible software. And he was actually laboring over this decision. I mean, maybe it's just, you know, my generation, but I think, you know, I want a car that's a great car. Why would I care about the software? Well, you know, to Katrina's point, the customers are going to drive what is really important and it's something to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, a really great summary of the situation maybe that the European car industry is in. <laughs> um, okay, maybe let's go to the final questions. Um, and this one, you know, let's see if we can make it a little bit policy uh, focused. So I, want, I was wondering if there is now one kind of particular concern or maybe a proposed solution that you kind of want to leave in the, in the laps of the EU policymakers that they should that they should um, go to what thinking of maybe standards, uh, licensing, reuse, cybersecurity, uh, digital sovereignty or digital autonomy. Uh, and maybe let, let's just go through one by one that maybe you want to start, we'll just do it alphabetically. Sure, locating the mute button. Yes, so I would say uh, one thing I've heard, I have a concern with that I would encourage uh, policymakers to clarify is that when we talk about digital sovereignty and data sovereignty, sometimes the idea of open source software and open data get conflated. Mm -hmm. So we just need to be very clear that open source software is software, and it may be the database where data is, and it may run the networks where the, the data moves on, and it may be living in a data center or a cloud that's driven by open source, but it has a different model for development and it has its own governance. Uh, open data, which is incredibly enabled by open source and has really exponentially accelerated our ability to find and use and deploy open data, has its own governance. And so mm -hmm. for legislators, when they think about digital sovereignty and what, we should just know that open source provides an opportunity to collaborate beyond borders and all benefit from the same the same benefits, the same features and functions of the software, but open data has its own governance structure and shouldn't be completed, com, uh, conflated. So I just mm -hmm. would like to encourage them to take care as they consider their policy maker, uh, making uh, not to fear open source because it has something to do with what, what ha where the data lives and how it's handled. Perfect, thank you. Uh, maybe Katharina, by last name, I realize, alphabetically by last name. <laughs> yeah. see it's before D. <laughs> no worries. I would actually have two uh, points to raise. So the first one I think we touched upon earlier is about the question of you know liability and, and mm -hmm. clarity or an, an easy to understand framework so that you know action items can be, be taken in, in that framework. I think that is something that needs to be thought through. And then the second one basically touches upon what Deborah said, um, but goes maybe a little bit further. I think the, the data flow is important. So as much as I love the GDPR and how protective it is in the European context, in the industrial context, and especially when collaborating across borders, you know, across continents, it can be an obstacle. So um, I'm wondering if, and, and that's not for the EU itself, it's mm -hmm. more like collaborate with the US and the Asian, Japanese, Chinese um, counterparts um, to enable uh, a, a more accurate uh, flow for data. I think that would be helpful. Fantastic. Uh, well, I guess we uh, we should also focus in uh, another time on the data questions becomes clear now. Uh, Michael, do you want to take the, the last one? Ah, we do not hear you unless Sorry, my fault. I think I made my point already, right? I think what, what I would like to see is that um, there's a little playing field also for small and mid-sized companies. So mm -hmm. in, in Europe, we are driven by the so-called hidden champion. There's a lot of innovation potential within the small and mid-priced companies. And over, don't overrun them by, 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 by policies like GDPR, which they cannot figure and hinder innovation by this. I'm not saying that we don't need this one, but maybe we can have an active approach, right? Find best practices, support them with, with guidance 
that even small and mid-sized mid enterprises can fulfill this kind of regulations, maybe on data, maybe on AI, maybe on other things, um, so that they are able to compete when it comes to innovation, when it comes to features with the big corporates. Okay, thank you. Well, um, then I think uh, we're wrapping things up here. Uh, a few minutes over the, the time now, but I think still okay. Um, thank you to all the speakers, so to Michael, Depp and Katharina, but also to Gael and to uh, MEP Marcel Collaja uh, for providing an intro. Um, I really, uh, I took a page full of notes. Uh, that's very interesting, uh, very, very helpful. I think for me, maybe one of the points that really stuck out was the point of culture and the kind of the evolving awareness that is happening now in the sector and how much work there's still to be done. And I think this culture aspect might be really this, uh, or I think that's what uh, you said, the culture aspect, really the, the key enabler of getting to all the other benefits that come further down the line. Um, so for me, there's only one other thing to say is that uh, we will have a next um, uh, policy series event on the 20th of May on the European Commission Open Source um, Economic Impact Study, um, where we will talk about um, the um, the results from there on pol about policy recommendations uh, and check out our website for that. I think it will also be very interesting. And uh, thanks everybody for taking part and for asking some questions and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you so much.